and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. And now, a word from our sponsor. Welcome back, Yvonne. Thanks, Jamie. Now, what are some of Hask's more popular products? That's a great question. We are renowned for our repairing deep conditioning masks and five-in-one leave-in sprays. These products have developed a cult following with industry hairstylists and regular customers alike. And they are now the number one sellers in their respective categories, positioning Hask as one of the fastest growing hair care brands worldwide. So let me tell you a little bit about our deep conditioners. Depending on your hair type and texture, Hask offers a deep conditioning mask designed specifically to bring life back to your hair. The formulas provide intense hydration and incredible shine, making hair look healthier and feeling softer. Our deep conditioners are essential for preventing, treating, and combating hair breakage. Then there's the collection of five-in-one leave-in conditioning sprays, which are rock stars in our product lineup. Every hair type can benefit from a leave-in conditioner. These enhance the look and feel of all hair types, and we offer a wide range to meet your specific needs. Each lightweight formula infuses strands with a nourishing and protective layer that detangles, conditions, adds glossy shine, controls frizz, and provides heat protection. For healthy, manageable hair. And these are just two different treatments available in Hask's comprehensive hair care collection that provides stylists with consistent, gorgeous, camera-ready results every single time. Well, you can't go wrong with that. Thanks so much for joining me today, Yvonne. Jamie, it was a pleasure to be here today. And I will leave you and your listeners in the industry with this. The Hask brand welcomes the opportunity to continue building our relationship with the Hollywood styling community. If we can support a project you're working on, send us an email as we'd be happy to help. We can be reached at hask at stonemanagement.net. Thanks, Jamie. And now, our feature presentation. Today, I'm speaking with hair designer Lawrence Davis. Lawrence has done everything from owning his own salon to reality TV, talk shows, award shows, through to television drama and feature film work. We chat about some of the incredible projects he has been involved with, such as The Green Book, Just Mercy, Watchmen, True Detective, Mudbound, and soon to be released, Respect, the Aretha Franklin story. Pictures up. Last looks. Rolling. And... Welcome to the Last Looks Podcast, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. Hey, you're very welcome. I would like you to finish this sentence for me, okay? Mm-hmm. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Lawrence, and when he grew up, he wanted to be... A hairstylist in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> no, he, he really wanted to be a singer. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I went to performing arts high school, and I was a voice major. And uh, oh. that's what I thought I was going to be, a singer. But uh, it changed to something else. <laughs> I'm sure you still sing. I mean, little, it's not yeah. like... Yeah. I do a little. I sure do. So <laughs> That's good. Good to hear. I like where I am, though. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you move from performing arts college and everything into the hair world? You know, when the real world hit me, like after school, it was like, okay, you've got to figure out something. And... You know, I knew that it was it would be some sort of uh, artsy thing. I just didn't know exactly what because when I was in high school, I actually had a knack for sewing. Mm-hmm. I think I sewed my way through high school when it came to prom season. There were a list of students who literally came to me and said, um, "After I'll take it back." There was one girl uh, <laughs> who was a, a friend of mine who said she wasn't going to go to prom because she didn't have mm-hmm. anything to wear and all these mm-hmm. other things. It was a financial thing as well. And I went, oh, I'll make it for you. Yeah. And it started right there, actually. 
I knew that, you know, the basics from doing pillows and home economics and all that stuff that, you know, it, yeah. it's just a back in the front, stitch it together and you've got something. So I yeah. wound up making something for her and it became this whole thing. It, it, there are so many things that I made. I don't even remember. I looked through pictures and I'm going, I made that. But, you know, that was one of the easy things for me at that time, um, besides singing. And once I finished school, I always had a knack for cutting hair. I remember sewing, cutting hair, just little things, side jobs to make money for myself straight yeah. out of school because I didn't I didn't exactly want to go to college, but I didn't I did not want to go as well. I think I was a little mm-hmm. intimidated by the thought of going away to college and I was a bit afraid and did not do it. So I knew that my hustle would have to be whatever it is that I like doing and whatever was comfortable for me. And sewing and uh, cutting hair at that time was something that I made money doing. That's very cool. So yeah. it's just like, it sounds like you just had a, a natural confidence of working with your hands, like to be able to just embark on actually cutting hair. Cause I think even for some people who know that they want to be a hairstylist, that hair cutting bit is there's such a wall in between them and getting to that. They're so scared yeah. of it. There's that fear, mm-hmm. but it sounds like you just broke through that I, straight away. I did. You know, it was one of those things where once I started, you know, I, I was always cutting my own hair. And then I will say, I'll go back a little. My mom used to cut my hair and um, mm-hmm. my mom has said I'm seven brothers. So she was great at cutting hair and she used to cut my hair. And then I'd learned to do it myself. And from there, it kind of went to my friends in the neighborhood. And then you know, it just became this thing where I had a regular clientele and didn't, didn't even realize it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it just kind of... This, kind of, this thought hit me one day, what if I just do everybody, you know, not just the guys, if I can just do the girls as well. And that's when the light bulb went off, go to hair school, okay, become a cosmetologist, get your license and you can do it all and you be your own boss. And that's what I did. I worked part time and I went to school full time. So where did you grow up? Where were you doing all of this? I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, um, oh, cool. right outside of, a, uh, right uh, surrounded by DC and Philadelphia, but Baltimore's now mm-hmm. right there. And um, I went to high school there and I went to hair school there as well. I think that after graduating hair school, I remember it was Friday. I went to the salon on Saturday morning Mm. and I was scared to death. (laughs) What do you mean? I was the only, I was the new kid on the block. So I was like. Oh yeah. First day of school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First day of school. All (laughs) eyes on you. I've got seven clients coming in and. You know, just take a deep breath and jump in there. So I remember that day very, very well. And it it turned out to be a great day, but I'll never forget it. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, how did you have that job lined up? Was that a salon that you'd kind of been going to, to do work experience stuff or training? Ironically, there were two friends of mine who owned the salon and they had just opened the salon a few months before I finished hair school. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I had a job waiting for me the day I graduated. So that was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's awesome. Just to be able to step straight into it. Yeah, absolutely. But prior to that, I did do an apprenticeship um, at a wonderful salon in uh, Mount Washington, in the area of Maryland and Baltimore. And I think I was just a little, a little uh, anxious to, to move forward faster. So I left that job and went straight to hair school so I could finish it in nine months as opposed to two years of apprenticeship. Right. Yeah. I didn't know there was an apprenticeship option. There was, and I think there still is in Maryland. Um, But although I'm still licensed there, I'm not sure if the the rules have changed for the apprenticeship program. Yeah, there was a learning curve for me coming over here, realizing that there's a different license for each state. And I was just like, what? Okay. (laughs) Exactly. It was like that. And when I I came to uh, Los Angeles, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to do my license here and this and that and this and that. But once I was eligible to join the union and I I spoke with them, they were like, oh, as long as you're licensed in your hometown, we verify that and you're good. I was like, oh, great. (laughs) Oh, that's good. Yeah, I didn't realize that. That's fantastic. So it worked out perfectly. That's awesome. So you're you've stepped out of um, cosmetology school straight into a salon. How long do you stay doing salon work? Wow, I did. I, I, I stayed at that salon for about maybe a year and a half, and then mm-hmm. I uh, went into business with another person, and we we launched a salon together. Oh, cool. Yeah, we did that, and then after maybe about a year or two in that business with that particular person, I found a building and I was able to purchase the building. It was a small little building near Johns Hopkins University. And it was the perfect, perfect spot for a salon. 
I bought that building and I had a salon downstairs and I had an apartment upstairs. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> I mean, you're never getting away from work, but still. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the commute's like zero. <laughs> yeah. It was one of those things that, you know, you have not because you ask not. I, I, just, I just saw this little building there sitting on the corner and it was just perfect. And I was like, who owns this building? So literally I would get out of the car and I just kind of started knocking on doors. Do you know who owns that building? Do you know who owns that building? And one lady led me to a gentleman who had a little restaurant a few blocks away and it was his building and he actually mm. sold that building to me. So it was, wow. it was a blessing in disguise. And I did that for about five years and I kind of got tired of <laughs> the salon Mm. I got tired of the salon and I wanted to venture out and I had been thinking about the entertainment industry for a while. And with Baltimore being just down the road from New York, uh, like a mm -hmm. three hour drive, I would frequent New York a lot doing photo shoots and things like that. Just test shoots, trying to find an agency once I realized how to get into, you know, get an agent and what it took to get tear sheets and to get, to get spreads and magazines. Once I researched yeah. all of that stuff, I started going to New York a lot. And one day it hit me. I said, you know what? I really like the entertainment part of this. And I think I'd love to go to Los Angeles. I know it's furthest away, but mm. I think you have to be a part of you got to surround yourself by what you want to be a part of is what I thought. And I literally remember going to the store on lunch break and I picked up a magazine and I remember coming back to the salon, sitting in the chair and just kind of browsing through this magazine. And it, this magazine featured a story on Halle Berry and her hairstylist at the time. Mm. And I was so inspired by that story that I said to myself, it was April of 2001. Yeah. I said, um, you know what? I'm going to go to LA and the following mm -hmm. holiday, that I think was April. So the following holiday after that was Memorial Day. I mm -hmm. flew out to LA, got a hotel, flew out to LA, LA that weekend. It was Memorial Day weekend. There wasn't much going on at all. Everything was kind of quiet because of the holiday, but I just yeah. wanted to get a feel for Los Angeles. So mm. I remember staying downtown LA at the time and it was like a ghost town. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't what it is now, but it was a ghost yeah. town. But and you know, I got rented a car and I just drove around to spots that I kind of read about and found. And in that weekend, there was a friend of mine who, from the very first salon that I worked in in Baltimore, had a friend living in Los Angeles. And he gave me his information and I called him and he said, hey, you know, if you'd like to go out to eat or something, um, you know, please give me a call. So I gave him a call and come to find out he knew the owner of one of the salons that I had read about. And I met her and she said she had a chair available. If I was ever in LA and wanted a job, I could definitely work there. And not mm -hmm. only that, he knew someone who owned a fourplex and there was an apartment available. Oh, <laughs> so, my goodness. So with that, I said, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to say, yes, I'll take the apartment and yes, I'll take the job. Yeah. <laughs> I remember flying back home, just really excited. Like, okay, what have I just done? Yeah. Am I crazy? No, <laughs> this I, is exciting. <laughs> exactly. Because I knew no one there, absolutely no one. But I, I know I had read about so many different things and I wanted to just check it out for myself. So once I got back to my salon, I announced, hey guys, I'm uh, moving to LA. And everybody's like, sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> And the first day in the class were like, what am I supposed to do? And I'm like, well, um, I'll make sure you're in good hands and uh, this, that, this, that, you know. So mm -hmm. I kept going back and forth in my head as to when I would like to make the move and I wanted to sell the salon and all this stuff. And I did put the salon on the market and it wasn't selling right away. And I had actually gone to the calendar and marked down July 27th, 2001 is the day I'm mm -hmm. going to move to L.A. Yeah. And once I did that, it was kind of set in stone. I purchased mm. my ticket one way and I said, well, if the salon doesn't sell, I'll get my mom to just kind of oversee the whole selling process. So I did that and the salon sold shortly after I left for Los Angeles. But once I got to LA, I remember standing outside of LAX with my box and my boxes and mags and this feeling of fear just fell over me. Like <laughs> It was like, what the hell have you done? <laughs> I normally feel that when I'm in the plane on the place to where I'm like uh, on the journey. I don't feel anything. I'm just excited and stuff until I get on the plane yeah. and we take off and my feet aren't touching the ground anymore. And I'm like, what am I doing? Jamie, it was, what am I doing? 
<laughs> it was the craziest thing because, like I said, I knew no one except the gentleman mm. I met through a friend. And I knew of a, of a guy from Baltimore who moved out there, but I didn't know how to reach him. I didn't know any, you know, any numbers or anything like that. And yeah, just moved into my place, bought a little furniture, and I started I started working at that salon. And at that time, I was renting a chair, and so I had no clients, but I was renting a chair every week. So my savings were dwindling down. <laughs> I was mm. like, oh gosh. <laughs> So what I did was I just stuck it out and I started meeting people. And I remember one day um, going to, I actually had a photo shoot that I did with Essence Magazine. I met a young lady there who was a makeup artist and she was a makeup artist at E! Entertainment Television, which which I was obsessed with the entire time I was on the East Coast (laughs) because it was all I had. So I was obsessed with that network and she and I were talking and she's like, well, you know, I'll give them your name uh, at that studio and uh, maybe you can come over and work, you know, work sometime, freelance, I mean, uh, fill in sometimes. Hmm. And it actually worked out. I became a freelancer at E! Entertainment and I was there literally for years. Three years of that, of course, I, I became eligible for 706 after three years of uh, 60, 60, 60 yep. kind of days. And... Literally, E! Entertainment was a revol- is a revolving door. Everybody came through there. Everybody came through E! News. Everybody came through the talk shows. Everybody came through um, E! True Hollywood Stories. They'd set- they would send me out to do clients, you know, for those particular tapings. So I met a lot of people through in- yeah. E! Entertainment. I remember after leaving there, I would still get calls on what season to do red carpet and to do E! coverage of the Oscars and all those shows. So it was a great, mm-hmm. great family over there. And I'm still friends with them until this day. But that afforded me the opportunity to get into 706 and to get more into the film and uh, movie world, I mean, the movie and television yeah. world. So I was grateful for that journey. It was really, really all designed for me. I had no idea, but it all worked out. The, not, the dots connected. And Mm -hmm. here I am today still doing it. (laughs) That's very cool. So when you first moved to LA and you know you wanted to kind of get into the entertainment industry, were you aware of what kind of hoops you'd have to jump through with the union and stuff like that? Or did that kind of come along as you were starting to work? It kind of came along as I met people and got more, you know, had more questions about it and just found out exactly what it took to get there. And once I started making calls and, going through contract service. It's just adding, you know, adding adding things up and writing things down and seeing exactly what the process was. I thought, well, I've got a journey ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. But I think being a full-time freelancer at E! Entertainment five days a week afforded me the opportunity to have income as well as free time to do, you know, other jobs and to network and meet other people. So that was a great way to get in and still have a a decent income while trying yeah. to get into the union. So all of that just worked out. I'm just grateful for that. And it became more and more of a family and all the dots connected. I just met the right people and are still friends with those people today. That's very cool. I love making those relationships and those connections. Absolutely. With people. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so once you're in the union, what happens then? So things open up a bit more for you. So where do you go to from there? You know, once I got in, I, I you know, became, got on the roster and just through people that I met going to meetings and things like that. I will say, now I want to back up a little bit because I remember, mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember before I got into 706, um, mm-hmm. but right as I got into 706, a little before that, I met Tyra and I started working at the Tyra show. Tyra Banks. Tyra Banks. Yes. I'm sorry. I started working at Tyra show and I met her through Nico, who was Hallie's hairstylist. I met him through actually a classmate of mine in hair school. She came out to LA and she took his class. I had no idea where he was or how to meet him, but I remember reading about, Mm. I remember him, that article about him just inspired me so much. So I went to drop her off at his class and uh, he invited me to sit in on his class. And one thing led to another, I wind up working at his salon. And I met so many people through him. He was so generous. And he's just one of the people that I always tell people um, just gave me an opportunity that no one else would have given me. And shortly after working at his salon, I remember the full circle day that I met Hallie at a photo shoot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was like, oh, gosh, I just read about this guy and, and Hallie yeah. earlier this year. <laughs> and it was just the most amazing experience. But I met Tyra through Nico also. And I went to a few shoots with with Nico and to cover Tyra when he wasn't 
able to stay with her. And that led to me doing Tyra and having Tyra as a client and doing Top Model and the talk show. And I remember yeah. my first Emmy win was for Tyra's show. That's so exciting. It was so exciting. But, you know, I never knew that was uh, that could be a part of what we did. I never knew that was a part of being a hairstylist in Hollywood. I never knew we yeah. got those kind of awards and things like that. So I say that to yeah. say that my first union meeting was right after I won my Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm here, I have arrived. <laughs> so, I remember going to my union meeting. It was on a Sunday and I went to church that day and I came in with a suit and bow tie on and I was like, <sighs> Uh oh, <laughs> it was one of those. <laughs> they were nice and cordial, but it was just a weird, weird situation. But I always remember that because there's some some great people that I met there who were kind enough to call me for projects and allow me to day play with them and become a part of their uh, work family. And it just, you know, it just opened doors for me, not the Emmy itself, but the relationships I developed through meeting people at the union meeting. And it became just an extended family for me because I had no family out there. So my mm-hmm. work family was my family and still is. That's very cool. Yeah. I, I love all of what you're saying. It's so exciting. <laughs> I mean, just just to be, it's so funny, I find, that so many of us, I think, whether we're makeup or hair or, uh-huh. and you're kind of growing up and looking at things. And I mean, you watch movies and you mm-hmm. watch TV, mm-hmm. and, but it's it's it, it kind of gets to a point where the dots kind of join and you're like somebody does that person's hair and makeup yeah for that show exactly is that a job exactly. that's a job <laughs> oh my goodness and then you have that like you read the magazine you you look at this particular person hairstylist who's you know inspires you yeah. to meet this person which yeah. is crazy amazing you know it was, it was there were days when i literally had to pinch myself because i'm like i can't believe this is happening but it also so cool. was one of those situations. It was also that reminder that you had to be around it to be a part of it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you hadn't been in Los Angeles, you never would have. Never. Would have met. Yeah. <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. So I'm quite interested in just the differences because you've you've gone from like the e live news the talk shows doing the awards red carpet all these types of things like in reality tv Mm -hmm. and then you've done like drama tv and feature films and what do you find to be the difference but in those working environments because i've never i personally have never done you know like a reality show or a Mm -hmm. talk show or I, I haven't actually done anything live before yeah. either. So what's what, what do you find to be the differences? It's, it's, it's interesting because the world of talk show is very nine to five. And when I booked my first talk show with Tyra, we were also doing top model. So basically we were doing a nine to five and then we would leave there in the evenings and we would do top models. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> I was going to say that you eased into it was nine to five, but no, you were yeah. <laughs> moonlighting. <laughs> right. It became something else. But, it, but the exciting part about it was that world at that particular time was very creative because, you know, doing top mm-hmm. model, we, we were doing a lot of high fashion stuff and, uh, yeah talk show was you know a little bit more reserved but they're all kind of dynamics we did a lot of fashion shows and makeovers and things like that so that made the day really really cool and fun and Mm -hmm. the evenings would be the top model competition uh, huge photo shoots uh, different competitions of course between the girls but it just opened up so many fun things in the hair world and then once I got into more of the scripted. I think I remember getting called for J. Edgar Hoover to work on that. And that was one of mm-hmm. the first period movies that I was called for. And the time span was from the early 1920s up to, I think, the early 70s. Yeah. So I got to do hair for all of those periods and, and anything in between. So that right there was a different structure for me, but just to be creative in that world was such a high. And it definitely gave me a sense of storytelling and being able to actually show periods in time through hairstyles. It just gave me a whole nother sense of how creative we can be in our field and how we can tell a story through what we do. Yeah, absolutely. So once, once I started getting calls for that and other stuff, 
I just love the way that it worked out. I just love the way that I love the process from being called for a project to seeing that project on the big screen, you know, and everything mm. between. It just was, it's just a, that's an exciting process. And it allows you to, like I say, tell a story from start to finish through your craft. And yeah. once I started getting calls for other projects from other people and then getting asked to be in a key position, which was more responsibility just under the hair mm-hmm. department head, it just gave me more knowledge of what I needed to do to do a TV show or do a movie and from reading the script to breaking the script down to creating characters and collaborating with actors on the way they want to look and the way that I think they should look. And we coming to a happy medium and creating these characters that come to light. So it's just, you know, just the whole process became this whole buildup of just, just creativity. It just became, yeah. it became satisfaction and it became an expression of what we do. And I mean, you've done quite a few period projects. Now you've done like Mudbound. Mm-hmm. That was like post World War Two. Yeah. Was it? And then Watchmen, you had a bit of a flashback for the 1921 Tulsa. Yeah, that was amazing. And that was fun to work on because Watchmen was such, <laughs> Watchmen was such a, uh, how do I how do I explain it? Watchmen was all it was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it was the past. It was the present. It was just yeah. a whole different uh, world, and I had so much fun there because we never knew from episode to episode where we're going to end up. Once you read it, you're like, oh, we're 1920. Oh, we're 1950. Oh, we're 1970. Oh, we're 2019. Uh, you know, so it was just that whole cool. element of surprise and just having to be able to do storyboards and creative boards on looks at that particular time. It was just mm-hmm. the whole buildup of the energy of it. It just kind of kept you on your toes and it kept you guessing. It kept, of course, viewers guessing, like, where are we going next? But even, yeah. even with Mudbound, when I, went, when I did Mudbound, I got the call for from Dee Reese, who I had worked with previously. She's a great director that I did Bessie with. Yeah. And Bessie was a beautiful story from the 1930s. That was my first department head job on a period movie. Yeah, that one right there, and that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know, I, pre- I prepared for it. I researched everything I could possibly research. I, I knew the rules of what was worn and what was not worn, and what was mm-hmm. popular and what wasn't popular. And I had a great team, and that made a difference because it's never me. I can't do it myself. So you, you have to have the right team, and everybody can compliment everybody, and what one person can't do, another person can do, and we all learn from each other, you know, so having the right team is definitely important when it comes to doing movies, especially a period movie, and, you know, people having knowledge of this and knowledge of that, and us putting it all together, creating a wonderful project, and when I did Mudbound, Mudbound was a different, it was a different project, because it was a, a very low budget But once I read the script, it wasn't even about the money. It was about the story and the creativity of it. And it was one of the hardest jobs I had to do only because we did it in New Orleans in the summer. It was very, very, very hot. Mm. (laughs) Very hot. And (laughs) it was a challenge. And it was shooting around uh, nighttime and bugs. And, you know, that part, you just had to suck it up and think about the bigger picture. And at that yeah. time, I had Mary J. Blige, uh, who played Florence. I had Carrie Mulligan, who played the wife. And we just had a great time. Everybody was there for it. Everybody was a, wanted to be a part of it. And when an actor wants to be a part of a project and everybody mm-hmm. else involved wants to be a part of the project, it makes it such a smooth transition. To It makes it a smooth uh, a way to segue into getting that project done and completed and having quality work. Yeah. When uh, I think when the cast really want to lean into it, I mean, even if it's just leaning into their look or leaning yeah. into that period and you're just like, yes, they're willing to go there. Yeah. This is awesome. Exactly. It's so exciting. Exactly. And with um, Bessie, I'm guessing was that the first time also recreating yes. the historical figures as well? It was on my own. Yes. Um, I, like, I, I did work, like I said, on uh, J. Edgar Hoover, but on my own mm. as a department head. Yes. It was my first time on a period piece, excuse me, as a department head. And it was just one of those things where I knew that once I studied the look of that period, I know it was one of my favorite times in history to do hair. 
to create those looks. I just knew that I needed to stay within the parameters of what was worn and what was not worn in order to have an authentic looking project. Yeah. Did you have images of Bessie Smith to kind of Absolutely. copy? I, and... I had images of everybody <laughs> that I yeah. could think of who was alive at that time, whether they were African-American yeah. or non-African-American. I just wanted everybody to look authentic. So I pulled references from everywhere that I possibly could. And thank God for Pinterest and the internet and things like that, mm. that we have today that we can, you know, and then I pulled some great, found some great books that I uh, ordered and they were just the best references and just make a wonderful collection just to have in general. That's awesome. I think like I found in the past that I can get on this, this journey of wanting everybody to look just like mm -hmm. the person. But then at the same time, there are characters in the film who did exist, but nobody knows what they look like. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you do have a little bit of wiggle room there exactly. sometimes, I think. And it's always the director who kind of goes... Did you know who this person was before you started working on this? No. We, yep. Don't they don't have to look just like you know? There's a little <laughs> bit of wiggle room yeah, here. Don't exactly. worry about it. You're probably <laughs> introducing this person, you know, For the first to time. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like you wanna, you know, you wanna do right by that person, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting. I think yeah. the kind of balance of getting that that look right it, to it really recreate, is. but also. It's got to look right on the actor themselves. Yeah, and it really has to resonate through them because they want to bring this character forth the best they can and they want to be comfortable. Mm. They definitely yeah. want to be comfortable in that particular wig or that particular look that they're going to have to wear for you know at least anywhere from six to eight. 12 weeks, however long we're filming. So it's definitely that collaboration and that comfort level and that journey that's going to make everything flow and make everything smooth. Yeah. And then also you did Just Mercy. So what mm -hmm. was that, like 1989, early 90s? Yeah, Just Mercy was, uh, it was a South and it was in the early 90s, but they were still... I would say in my research, I still found that some of the people in there were still uh, locked in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Whenever there's a period piece, whether it's 80s, 90s, whatever, you kind of have to pull from a few years before that because you always have, you know, that old lady who still gets her roller set that she's always been getting. So it may be 1970, but she still gets her 60s, 1960s roller set because that's her look. Yeah, everyone's not high fashion. Exactly. <laughs> Everybody's not up to date. So with Just Mercy, I did some research and, you know, did people and how they looked at that particular time in the South. And I found that some of them were still in the 80s look more so than the 90s because of where they lived. So it all made sense once I started to research it. And I thought that, you know, this is a great thing because a lot of people would probably go, oh, it's got to be 90s. It's got to be 90s. But in reality, it's it's got to be late 80s, mid 80s, early 90s. All of that together. Yeah. So it gives you a nice variety too, right? It really, it really did. It really did. And that's that was such a wonderful story and such a wonderful cast. And we did it here in Atlanta and we did some in Alabama, a few days in Alabama as well. But it was definitely fun to play with those looks as well. It, it just, you know, it, it, I love to see it all come together, whether it's the uh, hair, the makeup, costumes, or even the set. You know, we're walking around buildings every day that have, that have been here for hundreds of years. But, you know, you put the right car and the right people dressed in front of those buildings and that building comes alive. I know. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. It's like that yeah. architecture has been there for years and we never paid attention to it until we put a 1930s Cadillac in front of it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah it's very cool. It's so funny because you, I mean, when you're prepping, you're kind of really focused on here, here, here. Yeah. And then you start working with, with you know, you see the fittings and the costume mm -hmm. and then, yeah, that day, that first day that you get that character ready from start to finish and they step on set and you're like, yes. Yeah, it's so exciting. <laughs> is that it's a final puzzle piece, like just popping it in there. And you're exactly. Like, yep, this looks amazing. Exactly. And there's sometimes when I'm a little, like, I'm a little stuck sometimes. So what mm -hmm. I do, I take a journey through production office and I go through the costume room and I, I walk their aisles and I look at their look boards and I'm like, ah, mm. aha. <laughs> I never looked at that picture. I never found that picture on, on uh, Pinterest. Can I have that picture? So it's all yeah. that pulling that together, just walking through other departments and just seeing 
even props and things like that. It's like little things come together and it all just works and creates the perfect picture. That's very cool. I was going to bring up Respect as well, the uh, Aretha Franklin story that you've oh, recently wow. done. It's not out yet, so yeah. don't get too excited, people, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, coming. it's um, coming. And that's a period piece, isn't it? Yeah. And recreating. That was great. That was all, uh, I want to say we started, we started with young Aretha. So we started with the late, late 40s, mid 40s. Mm -hmm. Aretha was a kid. So we That's traveled awesome. from uh, the 40s through the 70s. So wow. it's it's one of those situations where, you know, of course, there's different looks and different times, but it was so much fun and so beautiful to do because of the period of times. And then it was like everyday life in those particular days, but there was also performance life for Aretha and performance life for other characters in the movie. So got to do, you know, of course the reserve look, but we got to do the, 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 the fashion and the performance looks of the girl groups back then and the men and then and Mella Fitzgerald and just singers from that era who she was inspired by, who were friends with her dad, even the gospel singer, Clara Ward, who was known for having the biggest hair in the gospel world back then. So we yeah. got to, <laughs> we got to, we got to, we got to do some great work. And it's just a great story that basically tells of her childhood and her, her, her journey as uh, Aretha, young Aretha and her record labels and her relationship with her labels. And it goes to her latest project that came out, I think a year or two ago with her, uh, her documentary, the gospel documentary. And that's where the, the movie ends. So we got to full, we got a full flow of her looks from uh, her childhood in the forties all the way up to 1972. That's very cool. Yeah. It must have been fun for you too, just having that singing background and loving music and uh, and being there for something like that with Bessie as well. I mean, absolutely. it's very cool. You know, just being on set and having a day where it's nothing but music. It's just mm. so cool just to be there. It's like, you know, being at work, of course, but being back in time and feeling that music and feeling the the whole tone of what they they were going through or the whole feeling of the juke joint or the whole feeling of Aretha being in the recording studio at that particular time surrounded by her band. You know, wow. all of that, just having to sit there and listen to that music and reconnecting with it in this present day and listening to the lyrics and making more sense of it now that you really know exactly what it says <laughs> yeah. instead of, instead of what you thought it said as a kid, you know, the real words, but you know, all of those, I just, I will say that one of my favorite things to do are period pieces. I will definitely say yeah. that it's, it's just, it's just a world that I love to dive into. Oh, that's very cool. And what was Jennifer Hudson? Yes, Jennifer. Aretha? Jennifer played Aretha, and Jennifer has been a client of mine for years. I, I met Jennifer, I think, in 2006. Okay. No. Uh, yeah. No, it was before that. I met Jennifer in L.A., and we've been friends ever since. We've been friends like a, a good 15 years now. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. I was going to say, because you've done personal work for a few people, yes. right? Like Tyra and Mahershala Ali Mahershala, as well. I met Mahershala in LA. He gave me a call, actually. It was referred to him. He gave me a call and he came at a great time because I was finishing up a show called Claws in New Orleans. And that started. That looked like fun. I'm just going to say. That was, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. that was a lot of fun, but it was a, a heavy female show. So there were five mm. females. And literally, I remember finishing that show and I said, God, could you please send me a male client? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. Jamie, I kid you not. I, I said I, I was specific in what I asked for. And I said, God, please send me a male client. I would love to have a male client. And I yeah. kid you not, not even three weeks later, Mahershala Ali reached out. That's amazing. And <laughs> I went out to LA. I was out there uh, day playing with some friends over at So You Think You Can Dance, All Stars, which I would love. I, I do that every year when I have time off. I go out there and just, you know, hang out and work with friends. And I met with yeah. him. We had lunch. And he told me about uh, Green Book, which was a project that was coming up. And he told me about True Detective. And I did both of those projects with him. And they both were period pieces as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then also with um, True Detective, you've got like, was it three different looks oh, throughout the show? Gosh, yes. We went, from, we went from mid-80s all the way up to 2015. And he, yeah. uh, his character aged about... 40 years and just being able to be a part of collaborating with special effects makeup and doing his look as the older detective 
just was a great experience. I think that, you know, typically people go, well, you know, when they get older, we're going to have this receding hairline. I was like, no, nah, I don't think he should have a receding hairline. I said, not everybody who goes, who goes older, you know, lose, mm. the, lose their hair. So mm. with this character, he was able to have, you know, full head of gray hair, but still aging and still aged as an uh, African-American man would. And it was just wonderful just to be a part of that whole creative process and having these looks and the four hours of makeup every morning for him and me mm. and me coming in after and topping it off with the wig. It just was the icing on the cake. And having him as a client, oh gosh, it was the most wonderful thing as well. He's a great, great, great guy and just wonderful to work with. But um, Yeah, I think you can see that come through in his work. Like he's, oh... He's, I mean, he's amazing. Yes. He's amazing to watch. Absolutely. And it just, you can, I don't know, you can just see in those eyes that there's a kindness in there. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I definitely got my prayers answered when I asked for the, that male client and, and it was him. <laughs> so. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, so going into those looks a little bit more, because I'm interested as to how you did that, because I know in his younger years in that um, in that show, he had like a cropped, like he was kind of had a fade. Yeah, right? it, it was clipped down it was through faded. the side of the back, he right? Was, he was former military in that storyline anyway. Mm. So to segue from a former military to a police detective kind of, you know, was the look of the time anyway for a tapered haircut. And we did some research for a lot of the eighties detective shows for African-American men. And we did in the heat of the night as a reference, we did Sydney Poitier as a reference. And mm-hmm. we came up with these different looks for the eighties, nineties, as well as the two thousands for him. And they all kind of fit perfectly into those eras. Yeah. And what we did was with uh, the more tapered look, we definitely used his own hair for those looks in the early eighties uh, and uh, early nineties. And then as we like, wait, I'm sorry, in the early 80s, we did more of a uh, tapered look, but it was a wig because it was tapered, but just low cut. Um, okay. And then in the 90s, he wore his own hair and we did the tapered cut with more of a little high top fade. And mm-hmm. then the wig was more of his look for his elderly uh, years. But it was definitely a, a collaboration of pulling pictures and references and seeing exactly how to go back and forth between these characters while filming, not in order, of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> while no, filming. never. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So while filming, it's like, okay, we're in the 80s this day. Uh, we're in the 90s, so maybe we'll cut it today for the 90s and make sure we're wicked and we'll make sure it's fresh tomorrow morning. You know, it's just that whole juggling, that juggling mm. act that made it interesting, but it worked out so fine because, you know, we just had it all put together and we knew exactly what the looks were during camera tests and tweaking this and tweaking that. And, you know, it just made sense once we all sat down and figured out the looks on him as well as Steven's character and Carmen Jogo's character. Just They all just fell in together. And, of course, the collaboration with makeup and costumes just made it all perfect. Yeah. Who was doing the aging makeup on, on True Detective? On True Detective, it was Mike Marino's team out of New York. Oh, cool. Yeah. They mm-hmm. were amazing. And Diana Choi did Mahershala's wig and she did uh, Steven's wig as well. She's amazing. And awesome. I love Diana Choi. I love her work. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was a great watch. I, I love those those series and then when I saw the shorts for that I was just like oh yeah I've got to watch this season yeah so good (laughs) just some great (laughs) stuff I I I I will say I've been blessed to do some great stuff and I look forward to just doing more stuff in the future and you know I just love creating characters I love creating characters that resonate and that people can relate to when it comes to storytelling whether it's a movie or series or even a fashion or red carpet whatever I just love being able to create it and be a part of the process. Yeah. I think that must come through just because your excitement for storytelling and things like that. Cause I mean, you've worked on some incredibly moving films Mm -hmm. that have significant subjects Mm -hmm. and Mm storylines. So how has that been for you? like personally, but also as an artist. I mean, we've got The Green Book, Mudbound, Just Mercy, Bessie, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, man. That, like just such a credible story. Yeah, those stories, they're all – the thing about it is they're all based on truth. So, yeah. So, you know, they're all based on true stories. So it definitely was an educating thing for me because there are things that I wasn't aware of until I read those stories. Um, mm-hmm. Whether it was the actual book or the actual script, um, and doing my research, I was definitely brought up to date on some of the 
some of the things that happened and the experiences and who contributed to what in life. And the Henrietta Lack story was such an amazing story that I was not aware of. And, yeah. you know, at Johns Hopkins, it's the, it's the hospital, the city I was born in. And mm. it's like, you know, to have a story come out of that, the Henrietta Lack story, have it be such a huge impact on the world and medicine today. It just was wonderful to be a part of that project and when, when do you want to just briefly explain just for anyone who hasn't seen it who should watch it what the the story is with henry yes henrietta lax was a woman who uh who essentially died from cancer but her cells multiplied and reproduced themselves and her cells were used in all kind of stem cell research and things that were um that were kind of kept quiet but her cells mm. were the only cells they ever found in a human being that multiplied and were essential to all kinds of vaccines and all kinds of uh, treatments that modern medicine today still use. She was an African-American woman and she wasn't allowed to be treated in certain areas in, in, in Maryland at the time because of the time. And she basically had... I want to say she got in for a treatment and when her cells were, you know, when her uh, cells were taken from her body, she had no knowledge of it. So mm. basically she was curing the world and her story was never told. And basically she was curing the world without her knowing it. So basically yeah. everything that was taken from her was being sold all over the world in the mod in medicine and well, for cure. She had no idea. She had no <laughs> idea. Neither did her family until it, yeah. it all came out. So it's just one of those stories that really, really, when you dig deep inside, knowing that, you know, it was a beautiful African-American woman who who has saved millions of lives today. And Miss Winfrey uh, played Deborah Lax, who was Henrietta's daughter. And when I got the call to work with Miss Winfrey for that. Of course, I said yes right away <laughs> because I just knew that there was a great story there and I knew that she would do it some justice. Absolutely. It's amazing. I mean, all, all those films, yeah. they're just incredible stories. And it's, I mean, you know, you're learning from reading the script and then mm-hmm. working on it, but then, of course, all, all the people who get to watch the, yeah. the, those films as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And then, um, I was really blessed to see that when the book came out, they uh, used Ms. Winfrey's com- excuse me, picture on the cover of the, the book, the revised book. So it was just wonderful just to have my work there and have her 18-inch her hair in that two-inch wig. <laughs> that task of doing that every day. It's just, just, just being able to, like I said, build characters and tell stories. And it's just being able to do it with such great people. Uh, I've truly been blessed by that and I'm grateful for it all the time yeah i i imagine there's times on set with making films like that where it's quite emotional and you're just needing to be respectful of your space and the actors mm-hmm. and everything like that and their process absolutely so, absolutely and it becomes a, a relationship between you and your actor when you kind of know when to step back and let them have that time and i'll say with the last project i did right before i finished respect i did underground railroad with barry jenkins and that project will be out um, on Amazon probably next year. It was a very, very sensitive subject matter. Um, and Amazon was amazing with having counselors there so that anybody on the crew who felt, you know, some kind of way, you know, had someone to talk to. They were just mindful of the subject matter and the lynchings and the killings and things like that of slaves in, in that area of time that it was just one of the right things to do as a network. They brought in the right people for a sensitive subject matter, whether it was for the actors or the crew members. We all had access to some very, very healthy remedies for that mm-hmm. time. But just having that support system in yeah, place. Yeah, absolutely. So that's great. It's just it's important to be that for your actor, and it's important for a production to be that for you as a crew member. So yeah. I've always had great projects that, you know, when it came to sensitive subject matter, we've always always been taken care of, definitely. That's good to hear. Mm-hmm. 
It's very important. Mm. <laughs> and I guess when you're going into a job like that as well and you're heading the department, I mean, what are you looking for in your team of hairstylists? I mean, obviously that must come into it as well, that they have an amount of sensitivity to yeah. just what will be going on around them. Definitely. You know, I, I definitely try to bring a team together, not only people that I work with, but people that I would love to you know, develop working relationships with for future projects. Of course, you have to meet them somewhere and they become a part of the team or become a part of the list that you call because you know what they're qualified to do and what they can do. And I try to school everyone on the subject matter ahead of time and make sure that everything's clear as far as the looks we're looking for, the looks we're going for. And the sensitivity of the project or the, or the subject matter. I think with my team, it's always important for me to sit down and go through not only the script, but the time and the period and just what's sensitive, what's not acceptable at that particular time. We're just always aware of what's going on, whether it's the project itself or whether it's the crew or whether it's uh, upper production. Just want everybody to know who everybody is. If we have questions, be able to go ask questions and not be afraid to ask for what we need to be able to create the project or, or what we need to be able to be a strong department. I like to have people who are not afraid to ask for what what's necessary. I'm not that person, you know, and I remember you know, not being able to speak up for things because I was a shy kid. So I, I know that in order to have things and have what's what's needed, you just got to go and ask for it now. That's yeah, it. and I think it's nice that you make it a, a point to make it known that communication is a positive Definitely. thing within the team <laughs> and to keep the, those communication lines open and, yeah, and they, they're supported and it sounds good. Yeah, it, def it, good definitely, it definitely is. And I like to, I like to make everybody comfortable. You know, there's no, yeah. there's no person that I feel shouldn't be there. I, I like, I like to make sure everybody's there and that everybody's there as a team. There's no, no situation where someone feels left out or non-supported in any kind of way. It's just important. It's important to me to have a wonderful and peaceful department. Yeah, I think everything's just a lot more fun, and mm -hmm. it just runs a lot smoother, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. We're having a good time at work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I want that experience to be definitely a, a fun, a fun experience and a place that you rem remember. And would love to come back to. Yeah, I think when people are feeling confident and safe, they create better work. Exactly, exactly, yeah. and and not only that, it's a learning experience because I, I've had some people who've worked on period pieces, you know, that may have been their first time, and the level of excitement that they have just makes me happy that I could actually bring them in to be a part of something that they'll always remember because I remember my first time. Mm. I remember my first time and the level of excitement that I had, I would go home so happy because of the beautiful work that I helped create that day. And just to see it on the big screen after, you know, after it's in, out in distribution, just, it's just a peaceful and wonderful thing to have. So I know that that person who came for the first time and worked on that movie for the, on Bessie for the first time or Green Book for the first time or whatever it was, you know, they'll always remember that. That's very cool. Now, because we are always learning as artists, what is something that you've learned recently that excited you or you thought was just plain helpful? You know what? I bought in on respect sometimes 25 and 35 hairstylists and <laughs> for those huge days. And I, mm -hmm. I, I would just watch people work in the background area and I would just see that, you know, there was there were particular looks that we're going for, but I was really, really pleased to see that everybody took direction, definitely, but not everybody went the same way to get that particular look. So I learned from people who I saw for the first time doing hairstyles that I've done or that other people have done. You know, they've gone totally to the left to do it. And this person went totally to the right to do it. And they ended up at the same place. So yeah. learning from other people has always been something that I have never, ever been above because in order to move forward, you have to learn mm. things. One thing I definitely will say that respect gave me, gave me a push forward to, to think outside the box because <laughs> it was one of those situations where in, in, in any film, in any project, a director can say, you know what? I think we should do this this way. And we tested it a whole nother way. So there were times yeah. when I had to pull a rabbit out of a hat literally, literally pull a rabbit out of a hat. And I welcomed those challenges because I was able to do it. 
I was able to do it and do it successfully. And those things would probably stress a lot of people out. But at the end of the day, it rewarded me because it made me stronger. And I think that being being in a position to be challenged and to think to make you have to think outside the box is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'm oh, always yeah. I'm always I won't say I'm always prepared, but I have found out that I am always prepared by having enough of what I need, more than enough of what I need, should I say. There were people thrown in at the last minute for roles in respect. And literally, I would have to go, okay, think, think, think. <laughs> what can you do for this person to achieve this look? Bring them in the trailer and my adrenaline would just go and I would make it work. And I, I just have to say right now, I have a big smile on my face because there were instances where I knew that the only thing that was going to help me through this was God. <laughs> or that was going to yeah. make me able to achieve this look on this particular person. And, mm-hmm. it, and it worked. And that beca- that's because I was more than ready and I was more I had more supplies than I needed to have. I had a little bit of everything that I could think of. And, yeah. and extra. Yeah, I think being prepared and just open for that challenge. Exactly. Like, bring it. Come on, bring let's it. do this. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, exactly. And then with that, I had to do wigs early on. So I had wigs, you know, on the shelves, just wigs sitting there, just never knowing who it was going to be for. But I knew that it would be used at some point, and it was. <laughs> it it was cool. that situation where there would be 25, 35, 45, 55 wigs just sitting there. Yeah, And they all were used, every last one of them. So being prepared is definitely key to being Yeah, successful. that's awesome. Hey, now I was going to ask you, what is one tool that you wouldn't want to work without? And I understand that there are probably plenty, but I just want you to try and choose one. <laughs> one tool that I would not want to work without is a rat tail comb. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. And I'll tell you what happened. One time I was with rat tail, a rat tail comb was definitely one tool that I would never want to work without or have to have. But I remember being with a client and we were doing press. I remember leaving the hotel. I set her hair and she said, you know, we'll comb it out once we get to the studio. Well, we get to the studio. I can't find my bag. Uh-oh. I left my bag in the car. We, ah. we get upstairs and things are still being set up and... She goes in and she gets makeup touched up and I start pulling her hairpins out and I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't know where my bag is. I need my bag. I need my bag. And I get, excuse me for a moment. I'll be right back. So I go out into the hallway and I find this little kitchen area. I find a plastic fork. I love this. <laughs> I find, Jamie, I find a plastic <laughs> fork and I go back in and I could, I do her comb out with a plastic fork. Oh my goodness. I love it. I do it with a plastic fork and it worked out. And she says, you did that. <laughs> she, <laughs> she just says, you did that. She never questioned it. You know, I got nervous, of course, because I couldn't find my bag. And of course it surfaced. It was in the car. I don't know how I left it in the car. But anyway, I combed her out. It's making it work. Making it work. (laughs) That's my point. It's making it work. I combed her out with a plastic fork and it worked beautifully. But it's making it work. It's It's trying to stay in control, not let them see you sweat. Pull a rabbit out of your hat if you have to, but make it Mm -hmm. work. Never say, I can't say, you know what? I'm going to try and make that happen. That's what I live by. And that's a prime example of one thing I always like to have. And that's a rat tail comb because you can do so much with it. So much. Yeah. (laughs) I know. I I always ask people this question and I've come to the conclusion that that is my answer. I'm a a tail comb. Cannot be without my tail comb. And I, I, I'd feel a little naked if I didn't have just a small can of hairspray with me. Yeah. I have to say. I could do yeah. a rat tail, <laughs> small can of hairspray, and a little little thing of pomade. I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's what we have good. to do. That's it. Good to go. And it's just, it's, it's a lifesaver. Cool. It's, it's, a, it's the perfect little setback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, now, what one person would you like to hear on the podcast? Oh, my gosh. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> My friend Dean Banowitz. Dean um, does a lot of uh, the competition shows, and I, I, work, oh, cool. I work on those with him. American Idol, okay. World of Dance, uh, So You Think You Dance, All Stars, America's Got Talent. He department heads all those shows, and 
such a great person, such a great family over there that we have. And like I said, whenever I have time off in the summers, normally I take six weeks and I go out to LA and I day play and hang out with those guys on those shows because we have such a great time. And it's so creative, yeah. such a creative team over there. That's cool. What's his name again? Dean Banowitz. I'll send you his information. I have a funny feeling that I've seen him on um, Instagram. He has a big beard. Yes, he does. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. my guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. my guy. I love Dean. Dean is such a great friend and he would be so much fun. So much, so full of knowledge, so full of knowledge. Oh, and, cool. You know, he's awesome. I love being a part of his team, you know, being on dance shows and things like that. You have to be, you have to really think outside of the box as well because they're dancing and moving. So you have to create styles yeah. and create things that won't come out of their head. It's got a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But those are, those are my, those are my family. I love those guys very, very much. I don't get to see them much, but they, they have definitely have been a blessing to me. They don't, they don't even know it. Oh, that's so cool. Well, they might now. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lawrence, thank you for chatting with me today. You're it's welcome, been such Jamie. a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, I love sitting down and just talking talking hair and talking television and film it's just like the best thing for me it's so motivating and it excites me definitely excites yeah. me yeah yes indeed i can tell you <laughs> you're very passionate about it it's awesome i love it it's you know it's, it's one of those things i i i strived for and i got into it and yeah, i'm here to stay yeah i love it i love your story thank you so much you're welcome thanks for having me For links to see more about our guests, go to our Instagram at The Last Looks Podcast or our website, thelastlookspodcast.com. If you want to keep up with new episodes being released, be sure to subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, YouTube, or any podcast streaming platform. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, share it. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.